Hello, this is Dr. Julie Fernandez from Houston Baptist University, and this is the slideshow for preparing for the Texas 68 principal exam. This is a part of EDAD 6192, the leadership seminar. Uh, the expectation is that you watch this PowerPoint video, which is only about 30 minutes long. And then afterwards, go, go to your syllabus and you will see other assignments that you will need to do for this first night. Again, this is just an, an introduction to the exam. You will get more information as you work through this seminar, especially on the Saturday uh, seminar training that we have coming up really soon. The goals for this PowerPoint is we're going to go over the principal standards the Texas Principal Domains and Competency, so that Texas means for the test. We're going to talk about the responsibilities of the school leader and connect all of the standards for themes on the expectations of effective principals. You're also going to understand the expectations of the HBU um, in terms of the passing scores for your practice exams. And then I'm going to be giving you all through this slideshow ideas of how you can create your study plan for both the practice and the official exam. For the practice exam, you will have to score an 80% or higher if you want to be approved to take the official exam. That's 32 out of 40 correct answers on the practice exam. Uh, of course, our goal is always 90% or higher. Uh, we will be working with you again and helping you if you do not reach 80%. And uh, you'll be working with your intern supervisor during that process. The official exam is 120 multiple choice questions. Actually, only 100 count. They have 20 questions, which are field questions, as you're aware of through STAR. You have five hours. It's computer administrative, EC12 situations, and you will need to be able to interpret a taper report. So there will be a set of questions, and they will give you a taper report for you to review. The interesting thing is that both the practice exam and the official exams, you cannot write on the test. Well, obviously, you can't write on the computer, but on the paper pencil test that you'll be given as a practice exam, you'll be given scrap paper. So you might want to be thinking about test taking strategies since you can't highlight and underline or cross out letters as you know the strategies we teach students about test taking. You won't have that opportunity to write actually on the test. You will be asked to bring a Scantron to that practice test. In the same view of this situation and the computer administrator, you'll be given some paper and pencil and you need to be able to use that to um, navigate your strategies for the exam. The official exam and the practice exam uh, is broken up into three major pieces. So domain two, which is 44% of the test is about instructional leadership. Then you go to uh, school and community leadership at 33% of the test. And the um, of course, administrative leadership is at 23%. It's slightly more under instructional leader, and that's where the trend is going nationwide on the expectations for principals is that they become strong instructional leaders. If you have not taken instructional leadership yet, uh, as one of our courses, we will be kind of help you out and fill in some of those gaps so that you can be successful on this exam. The question formats. So we have most of the questions are you'll give, be given a scenario, a situation, so to speak. And sometimes you'll get one question or you'll get a decision sets. And so you will have one scenario and multiple questions about it. Sometimes you have clustered questions, which are you have it's kind of like a decision set, and then what you end up having is like Roman numeral one, two, three, and four, and then the question is which one's the best combination of what you do. Um, oh, I pick that we do one and four, or two and three. So um, we'll again show you how to navigate that kind of uh, test-taking strategy if you don't already know how to do that. 
Then there's multiple response questions in which they ask for you to pick the best two out of the three answers. So that's that's an interesting concept. So again, you have to learn how to eliminate and you can't write on the test. This is a test of philosophy and procedures. It's not content based. So you're not really asked to memorize things, but you should know and understand the concepts and some of the procedures and um, strategies for leadership. So it's all about best practices. As you notice, this slideshow kind of has a Superman theme. And so the focus is, and the point of that is that we are looking for super principle principles that are in these tests or the sample principle that they use makes all the right decisions for all the right reasons and it's not um, they don't do things half done so that leads me to this slide is this is not a time to take shortcuts in leadership so many times when you're watching your principals working and your assistant principals they 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 do what they do based on what they have and and not every situation is perfect they might not have all of the resources uh, they need and so they kind of take some shortcuts uh, around practices not bad things at all but just getting making it easy and working through the situation and being creative in this exam however they don't want short shortcuts they want you to do it the right way the most effective way so you have to think of the best practices and and not shortcuts if you took the teacher's exam most of you did you you understand what i'm talking about it you might have watched your teachers when you were student teaching doing one thing but the expectation is another and it's just at a very high level so just be aware of that so you're like well my principal does it this way and that's not one of the responses try to think best case scenario every single time principal Standards of Texas are broken down into five areas. You have the list of all standards, both in your internship syllabus and on this syllabus. Uh, I, my suggestion to you for as a study skill or a, something to do to study for this exam is to read these very carefully and go through and start highlighting adjectives and verbs what are these principles expected to do um, how are they expected to behave what at what level are they expected to perform and read those really carefully so if i was studying for this exam i would probably go through highlight all the words that i think just pop out under each of these areas and i might write a bunch of them down and then i'm going to take it to the next step on the exam, and if you look at the test manual that you were asked to download or uh, print, uh, you will see that inside it they talk about the Texas domains and competencies. So this narrows the scope a little bit from the Texas standards. You know, the standards are really long. There's five of them. It's really intense. This narrows a little bit more. So we have three domains and nine competencies. And this is really what you're being tested on. So we got school and community leadership. Now, if I read competency one, the principal knows how to shape campus culture by facilitating the development, articulation, implementation, and stewardship of a vision of learning that is shared and supported by the school community. If you look in your handbook, you will notice it'll say the principal will, and it gives you a list of things that the principal will do or does based on this competency. Now, I could go through and do the exact same thing as I did on the principal standards and start highlighting words that I think are real key to this concept. So looking at competency one, I would highlight campus culture, facilitating, articulation, implementation, stewardship, vision, um, shared and supported school community. And so I would do that for every single competency and all the descriptors. And then on the side, write down all of those words that I'm picking out. So I kind of have an idea of the expectations here. 
I can look at Domain 2 Instructional Leadership and do the exact same thing. Again, underneath, if you look in the manual, you will see all the uh, more specific descriptors. Go through and start highlighting and acknowledging those words, gathering all of those words together. And again, Domain 3, same thing. We got two competencies here. And the interesting thing about administrative leadership, if you look at the standards, that really is um, strategic leadership and executive leadership combined. And if you look at competency one, this is the one that makes everybody nervous is because you see campus budgeting and personnel and resource, financial management and technology use. So uh, yes, there are questions about the budget. It's mainly asking you to make choices. How does a budget create it? How do you um, bring in stakeholders on creation of the budget? Um, so forth, and I'll talk about this a little more. So you, at this point, you have looked at the standards, the five standards, and you've highlighted words and ideas from each of those and read those very carefully because they really base the questions on those. Then you want to look at the Texas domains and competencies and do it again. Highlight, bring out the words. You're going to start seeing the theme going here. But then look at this. This is McRell's Balanced Leadership 21 Leadership Responsibilities. We put this as a supplemental textbook for your choice. And if you haven't looked at this, it's really a fascinating book. But um, when I was in Austin last time and I was talking to some of the creators of the exams and the future exams, they were really into this book and they thought those 21 leadership responsibilities were key. So if you look at these, you may see some of these words are very familiar with what you see in the standards and the domains and the competencies. I see communication, culture, focus, uh, knowledge of curriculum and instruction and assessment, monitor and evaluate, relationships, resources, visibility. So you're starting to take these words. So now you have three sets of terms and words you can use to kind of guide you a little bit. Even on top of that, if you look on your Blackboard site after this video, you'll see something called Texas Vocabulary. And what we have done is each professor, there's five of us working on this seminar together, we each selected one of the standards and we made it, created a glossary for you with words and terms. So you can use those also to kind of just have an idea of what everything means and what is considered most important in school leadership. Now this is my list. This is me just brainstorming, going through the different lists, and this is a very short, small list. Um, but you'll see that there is definitely some words out of all three documents, out of the standards, out of the domains and competencies, and out of the 21 responsibilities. And I just grabbed a few. Now you can take my list, but I'll tell you there's a, the list is much longer. And it's going to be what resonates with you. It might be an area where you go, you know, I'm not really strong in human resources or I'm not really strong in budgeting. So you want to focus on some of those vocabulary. Again, instruction is 44% of the exam. So you, you want to be in that area too and work with the vocabulary and terms and the ideas of the expectations for school leaders. Um, things to remember, watch for key terms, but collaboration and high expectations are keywords. If the answer has collaboration or high expectations, you're, you're almost there, okay? Watch for the words first, next, legal, implement, design, and articulate. Um, when you're looking at first and next kind of questions, they're looking for the process of decision making. Um, and we're going to talk, I'm going to give you some ideas on how to process that in a minute. Legal is very important. If it talks about legal, you know it's black and white. It's whether it is legal or not. And especially in student discipline, you will see that and in special ed questions. Implement is, you know, how do you implement something, design, articulate. Um, that's really focused on communications.
So let's think about this. Uh, what I want to do is I want to talk to you a little bit about planning, problem solving at your school or problem solving in these terms of these test questions. And what I've always used and taught is API. Now, for some of you, uh, you have heard this from me multiple times and you're pretty, you know this. Um, however, for some of you, this might be new. I learned this strategy uh, when I was preparing for my superintendent's exam and it really helped me galvanize the process of decision making. So A stands for ask, ask, assess. So I want to assess the issue. So whatever problem there is, you have to assess whether or not there is a problem and it's all based on data. So data is super important in assess. That could be attendance data, discipline data, not just test data. There's so much, you know, survey data, whatever it is. So if you have a problem, the first thing you want to do is assess to see if you really have a problem and that should be based on data. Don't waste your time on something that's not an issue or it's a very minor issue or it's not an issue that's really going to make or break your school. The second part is the planning part. I found out I have this issue. I now have to plan for a solution. A whole lot of people get caught up in the assessing plan. Well, we have a problem, we have a problem, we have a problem, we have a problem. And all they talk about is the problem, but they don't talk about a plan to solve the problem. So in your situations on your exam, you may see that they're talking about the problem and they've assessed it so the next step, obviously, we will is plan for a solution. And planning means strategic planning. And that could be in your campus improvement plan. It could be in your ham teacher handbook, your student handbook. So what is the plan to fix the problem? Then implement. We got the plan. Now we're going to implement it. So how are you going to implement it? Are you implementing it according to the plan? Sometimes say we're going to plan something and then we don't implement it anywhere close to because there, nobody's on board. And implementation, really the most important part of implementation is communication. Are you communicating to people what they're supposed to, the plan? Did you communicate that there's a problem, here's the assessment, this is the data that says we have a problem. Here's the plan that we have and we did this point, we worked on this plan co uh, collaboratively with different stakeholders and now we're going to implement it and that implementation is communicating what the expectations are. And the final piece is evaluate. Once you've gone through the implementation, you have a timeline, a very specific timeline to determine whether or not this what you implemented, what your plan is, actually is making a difference into the issue that you have. So many times people come up with a problem, they come up with a plan, they implement it, but they never evaluate it. They don't know if it works or not until it's too late. So it might be, all right, our reading scores in fifth grade are low. And for our Hispanic population, our ELL students. And so our plan is to develop, um, and that's based on test scores and teachers' grades. And so our plan is to have a special um, intervention time for our students in which they will work on this uh, program, um, say it's a technology program to help them with their reading, to give them feedback. And we're going to implement this plan for six weeks. And so the students will go into this lab work for the next, you know, for one hour a day for the next six weeks of school. And then we are evaluating, we'll evaluate them with a benchmark exam. And then we'll look at that benchmark exam and go back and assess whether or not that's working. If it is, yay, we'll keep doing it. If it's not, we now have to plan something else and then implement that and then evaluate that. So using a pie kind of helps you envision that this is a cycle, it's a circle. You're constantly going around. The pro a lot of schools, what they do is they don't evaluate. If you looked at your student handbook or your teacher's handbook, how many policies are in there that nobody ever enforces? They never evaluated whether or not the implementation or the plan 
actually work. It just stuck there. We just have it there. It's not doing us any good. Um, it's just words. And that happens all the time. So evaluation is one of those things a lot of people forget. So things to remember. You can't evaluate what has not been implemented. You can't implement what has not been planned. And you can't plan without assessing the problem in the first place. So I just went backwards, didn't I? So that's the, what, when you get to your scenario, you want to think about, okay, where are we? And where are they in that situation? Are they at the planning stage? Are they at the, um, I'm sorry, assessment stage, uh, planning stage, implementation? Are they needing to evaluate? And that's when I said, when you see the words first, next, that's where that's going to be come into play. And you can use API to help you out. Know your processes, uh, no SBDM, site-based decision-making. Now, um, what's key on this process is to know that SB, SBDM is not an option in school districts. It is not a part of their policies. It's actually Texas policy. It's in the Texas Administration Code. You, every school district and school must have um, a site-based decision-making committee. It's not an option. So you may want to look at the code online uh, and review what's expected. And you know what you're going to find out is that's not how you, most of you do it in your schools because districts kind of play around with it a little bit. But there's like specific members that are supposed to be on so many teachers who represents how they're voted for. Um, there's how many uh, business or community members have to be on, how many parents have to be on, and it's very tight. So you have to understand that process based on what the state of Texas expects. When does the principal go to it? The, actually, the principal is the chair. <laughs> they're supposed to be in charge of it, and they're supposed to be sharing all sorts of information like the budget, like school attendance, um, curriculum and assessment issues, um, those decisions are made in that committee. This is not a top down where the principal makes all the decisions and then the committee just says, oh, that sounds great. It's actually votes and they have to have minutes and the minutes have to be posted and the agenda has to be posted. And it's really not an option for a school or a district not to follow the Texas Administration Code on the um, site-based decision-making committee. Know LPAC, know what the process is. Uh, understand RTI as the purest form of RTI you can imagine. All the tiers, not what your district created, what's the real thing. And that should be in your special ed book or online, you can find that. Also know your special education procedural safeguards. So know what free and appropriate public education is, understand the due process, FERPA, um, the IEP process, how that goes about, understand manifest determination. In fact, what I did was on the um, Blackboard page under course documents, you'll see I actually put a link in there to give you more information about special ed. And then finally, the budget process. Understand the budget process. Understand how that is through site-based decision-making that the principal is not supposed to just determine what they do by themselves. They have to use um, the committee to help them. And they have, to, you know, they're supposed to show the budget to the teachers and the parents, and they're supposed to share all of that information. It's not supposed to be secretive. Surprise! Like I said before, it's what people actually do in schools versus what's best practices. So best practices is the principal works on the budget in conjunction with the teachers and the site-based decision-making committee. Things to, another thing to remember, just narrow the answers to two. That's a good test-taking strategy, but what would lead to collaboration is the answers and or what would address the needs of all students. That's what you're focusing on. Which would lead to collaboration? So which are the answers would lead to collaboration or which of the answers, answers would address the needs of all students? 
You must have a moral compass. You know the difference between right and wrong. So it's that thing with integrity, fairly, ethically, legally. Legally is big on this one. So everything you learned in law class about what you can and can't do by the law. And we see things all the time coming up in the news about um, whether or not kids can say the pledge or say the prayer in school. You go pure law here, guys, not sometimes what you are doing in our districts. Um, you, you know, what is free speech? Um, what is fair? And this actually comes up a lot more in discipline issues. You know, you can't expel a kid, just walk up to him and expel him. In the same right, you can't just fire a teacher. Because I'm going to add this in here really carefully, so because I've seen a lot of people get this question wrong. A principal cannot fire a teacher. I'm going to repeat that. A principal cannot fire a teacher. However, a principal can recommend non-renewal or recommend termination because a principal does not hire a teacher. He, makes the, he or she makes a rep, uh, recommendation to hire to the school board. The school board hires, fires, terminates, whatever you want to use the words, or non-renews. It's the school board who does that, not the principal. So be careful. I, I, I've seen a couple of essays recently and somebody says, well, I'll just fire the teacher. And it's like, you can't do that. The process is too, um, too much for you to just fire on, on the spot. Even if they hurt somebody or they're inappropriate with a child, you can suspend them off campus while the investigation, but then you make the recommendation to the school board, and the school board is the one who determines whether that teacher keeps or loses their job. Things to remember, understand the special ed processes, ESL, ELL, LPAC, R, R, LRE, LEA, you need to know what accommodations and modifications mean. Know the difference between an accommodation and a modification. On the budget things, remember your budget, your staff development, your staffing, everything is based on the campus improvement plan. Everything is based on the campus improvement plan that you all created in the, in the, um, in the committee, <laughs> site-based decision-making committee. You created a campus improvement plan and your budget is based on that. Your staffing is based on that. Your curriculum is based on that. Your decisions are based on that. That's why one campus improvement plan cannot be used at different campuses. Working collaboratively with stakeholders to develop your budget. So again, it's a group effort, not just the principal. Now you're going to, again, I know what you're thinking. You're like, wait, my principals never showed me the budget or never shared it. I was on the committee and they never talked about the budget. We have no idea what you're talking about. We're talking best practices for the exam. This is what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and again, don't misappropriate funds. So you can't jump fund codes. And for those of you who are taking budget, you know what I'm talking about. Funding codes, can't you can't jump. So be careful. Student safety is probably one of the most important things that comes up, especially in student discipline issues. And they've had some questions surrounding um, safe schools in terms of weapons and drugs, bullying. You remember, it just comes down to what's safe for children and what and that due process is followed. And that if there's a question between um, uh, textbooks, uh, selecting the textbooks or working on a, a new uh, procedure to keep kids from being bullied, that's the one you're going to pick as the bullying issue over the textbook issue. It always comes first. Student safety always comes first. Some things to remember about the test is that we have 70% of our districts in the state have less than a thousand students. So when um, when the answer choice is to contact the superintendent, 
in your mind, change that to say contact supervisor. Because in large districts, you would contact your supervisor. However, in small districts, there aren't any supervisors. You're going to contact the superintendent. So if it says contact the superintendent, again, change that in your mind to say that's my supervisor. Because I know that in Dallas, nobody's going to call Dr. Hinojosa. It's a huge district like HISD. They're going to contact their supervisor. But if the question comes up and it's like, you know, you would have, for example, if you had, um, oh, I don't know, uh, students cheating on the STAR exam and what would be a step that you would take, you would have to contact your supervisor. In a small district, that would be your super, superintendent. In a super large district, it may be your area superintendent. So it just depends on where you are. So think of contact supervisor in that situation. You need to know the taper report really well. They're going to give you a taper report, and they're going to ask you questions about the taper report. Um, if you go to the TEA site that I have on the slides, you can look up the glossary, and you can review the glossary for terms that might help you. If you're not sure what something means on the report, go ahead and check out the glossary and use that as a study guide. Um, we are going to give you an example uh, an assignment coming up on the taper report. Look at your syllabus and you'll see when that is due. Um, but you, we're going to ask you questions so you can start practicing interpreting a taper report. Um, creating a study plan. Now you're kind of having an idea where you're going. So I'm going to say something right now that I want you to do. And this is how I'm going to know that you listened to this whole PowerPoint. So if you listen to this PowerPoint, you have a discussion to do this week. On that first line of the discussion, what I want you to write is, I listened to the PowerPoint and I know not to take the practice exam in the preparation manual. I repeat, I watched the PowerPoint and I know I am not supposed to take the practice exam in the preparation manual. If you do that, then I'll know you were listening. We do not want you taking the, the practice exam in the preparation manual. In a day or two or the next day this class meets based on our schedule, you will go online under assignments and you will take the Texas Principal practice exam from the manual that you have. I have put it online and you will go through and take it online. The reason I don't want you taking it in the manual is because I want you to get a real score. I want you to be very um, honest about your answers because this is more for you than me. It's not like you're going to get a grade on this practice exam. What we want you to do is we want you to take the exam and then disaggregate the data based on the competencies and the domains of competencies so you know what you need to study for. If you go to the back, you can see all the answers, but that's not going to help you figure out what you need to study for. I hope that makes sense. So after you take the preparation, I mean the practice exam out of the preparation manual online, you will create a study plan. And so if you look in your preparation manual on page 78, you will see um, kind of a worksheet to help break down what you need to do. I've already told you about the vocabulary. I've already told you about the taper report we're going to work on. I've already told you about taking the standards, the domains and competencies, and the 21 leadership uh, responsibilities and looking at those terms and vocabulary to see an idea of what is expected of an effective leader. So I'm helping you already kind of pull that together so that you can study for this exam. Again, you, it's not so much to memorize, but understand the concept or the, the themes of the expectations of a school principal. Uh, hopefully, by December 1st, you will have access to Certified Teacher. You can go online. We're trying to set all of you up that are in the seminar so that you can start using this as a practice. 
um, we will give you information. You'll actually get an email to your HBU email giving you the access to this process where you can go online and you can just practice taking test questions. I give you the Wilmore books. Also, she has one that has practice tests in there. Take as many as you can. The more you practice and just kind of figure out where your thoughts are, the better you're going to do. If you go in cold thinking you're just going to get this, it's not a problem. It usually is a problem. So here's one, um, one more thing you can do. Okay, HBU rules. Uh, you must apply to take the practice test with the HBU Testing Center. We will be doing that on Saturday of the seminar. Doc, um, Harriet Sturgeon will be there and she'll be handing out the forms. For the internship, we have one day in which you can take the principal, um, proper, I'm sorry, the principal practice exam just for the people who are taking the seminar. If you cannot take it on that Saturday, you need to notify your principal your internship supervisor, the university internship supervisor. I know there's a couple of people that cannot take, um, go to school or do anything on Saturdays due to their religion. So what we will do is we will work, work it out with you, but everybody else has to take it on that Saturday. Um, your advisor will approve that. Your advisor is your supervisor. So that works. You must make an 80 or higher. We've already talked about this. And if, when you've been approved, when you go to take your Texas exam, you have to register and you have to pay for that. That does not come from HBU. What if I fail the HBU practice test? Well, again, you have to make 80 or above. If you're 70 to 79, you have to attend a review session with your internship supervisor. Below 70, you have to attend the review session and you have to re fill out a retake request form and retake the practice exam. And I put the retake request form on your internship Blackboard site now and I've given it to your supervisors. If you cannot find it, just let me know. What should I do after I pass the official exam? Other than just dancing around the house celebrating, yay! You, um, I'm sorry, after the official exam, that's when you really celebrate, um, you have to wait till you graduate first to apply for certification. If you're um, certification only, you can go ahead and apply for certification after you finish your last class. So you will apply by contacting Ava Mathis, and I gave you the email address right there. She will want the most current uh, service record and it has to come straight from your school district and she has the links for you to be able to access that and then she will send it to SBEC to get your approval for your certification. What should I do if I don't pass the official exam? Well you have to fill out that request for exam retake because we will not let you retake it unless we're assured that you show us some documentation that you did some type of remediation because you know how star counts against you at your school if your students fail the star exam it counts against your school when you fail a certification exam it counts against HBU that's why we have the practice test and that's why we're really strict about people taking the exam you have to be ready you only get to take it five five times so if you take it and fail it five times after the fifth time you are not allowed to ever take it again you're done. So don't let that bother you. I've only had, any, I think the most I've seen anybody take it is three times. And usually they're like within a couple of questions away. So just study and prepare. Study and prepare. And really don't uh, wait too long after you get approved to take the exam to take the exam. Uh, the, while it's fresh in your head. And again, you, if you put it off and wait till 2019, you'll have to take the new, ta new test. And that test is much more rigorous and it's much more expensive. We're talking $1,000 with everything, most probably $800 to $1,000 starting in 2019. Right now, it's less than $200. So it would be smart to do it now. This is the end of this presentation. Uh, for the preparation of or just understanding the new uh, principal exam. 
if you have any questions, be feel free to call me. Um, uh, my email address is jfernandez, F-E-R-N-A-N-D-E-Z, at hbu.edu, or contact your internship supervisor. Have a blessed day, and I will see you soon.